so hello everyone this is the final lecture on the mptel course mechanical characterization of bituminous material this course was taught by four of us murli krishna and myself neetu rai nivita and padmareka okay so let us quickly use this uh, next 50 50 odd slides to understand what this course was about so what i am going to do is to go through each and every lecture and show the snippets of what we intended to cover so first and foremost thing is why should we even do material characterization so what you see here in your screen is the uh, design framework for mechanistic empirical payment design there are many models the traffic model the environmental effects model the primary response model the distress model and the most important thing that is shown in the green color is the material characterization model and in fact it uh, is useful for the environmental effects model it is uh, the related to the primary response model distress response model everything okay so unless and until we really understand how a bituminous material response when it is subjected to loading and we are really talking about for the design purpose as well as the distress purpose so the primary response model is for the design purpose the distress model is for the distress purpose and the environmental effects model clearly tells you how the response of the material can vary as a function of temperature right what really was the learning outcomes for this the this particular course so i grouped it under many heads and i am just going to go through it once more first and foremost thing is the mechanical theory what exactly is this mechanical characterization of bituminous materials so if you recollect i mentioned it clearly as one laboratory investigation second is analytical models or what are called as constitutive models so these two things go hand in hand together whenever we use the term mechanical characterization of bituminous materials all right now what is the model that we choose for describing the response of bituminous material we selected linear viscoelasticity right and so what exactly is linear viscoelastic response what really are the response functions in time domain as well as in frequency domain is something that we will we should have understood by the time we finish this course the second is having mentioned the platform on which we are going to build our uh, characterization study we also need to know little bit about our material what is the product the main product the main product is bitumen how it is produced what is its chemical composition what really happens to the bitumen during aging and taking into account all these things with the linear viscoelasticity background how do we really write specifications for bitumen and there are many instances in which one should really modify the bitumen and when we modify the bitumen what are the different modifiers that are available and after you modify the bitumen how do you really quantify the performance of the modify the bitumen right so now once we have finished with the binder we go to the mixture for the purposes of design in a payment there are different types of moduli that are available dynamic modulus resilient modulus vectoral modulus how do we really measure them what is the underlying theory associated with each of them right and similarly for the distress characterization we are going to look at only at two distress one is rutting and another is fatigue in the rutting we want to talk about the dry rut field testing of the bituminous mixtures and then in the second one how do we really do the creep and recovery test on bituminous mixtures and post process the data and similarly for fatigue how to really conduct the fatigue test for bituminous mixtures and what are the various post processing methods so by the time you finish this course including this summary lecture you should be able to and find answers to all these questions you should be able to give answer to all these questions and if you are not able to even immediately give a response at least you should be able to know where to look for such information so what i am going to do is i am going to talk about the 
uh, I am going to, I have divided this into each lecture into three part. First and foremost thing is, what is the title of the lecture? What is the overview of the lecture? And what is the summary of the lecture? Okay, the very first lecture in which we dwelt in detail is about linear viscoelastic response. And here, what we did, we talked really about the elastic response, viscous response, viscoelastic response. And the viscoelastic response we talked in detail about a viscoelastic solid like response, viscoelastic fluid like response. We did some simple experiments, thought experiments in which we applied load and then we looked at how the material will deform for the elastic as well as for the viscous as well as for the viscoelastic response. So depending on the type of test that we did, we classified them under two categories. What is really called as creep compliance and stress relaxation. So these are the two material functions that we introduced. So when you apply a load and measure the deformation, the material function associated with that was called the creep compliance function. And when you hold the strain constant and find out how the stresses are varying, we call it a stress relaxation response. And similarly, when you are working in frequency domain, we also defined uh, different material functions. Again, the creep compliance function, stress relaxation functions. And in addition to that, we also had a phase lag function. Then we talked about the materials that ages. So when the moment you are talking about the material that are aging, you are also going to take into account the influence of the material creation time. In addition to the actual time, running time that happens, you are also going to have the material creation time. Then we discussed that under what circumstances one can even define the stress relaxation function or the creep and recovery function, creep compliance function that, that is the linearity of response. Then we introduced few viscoelastic models. So what really is the take home message for lecture one? The bituminous binders and mixtures are viscoelastic in nature. The viscoelastic solid like and the viscoelastic fluid like can be used to relate to the payment uh, distress. And the third and the most important thing is all the measurements that we are making, all the calculations that we are doing for payment specific binder specification or payment uh, design uses only linear parameters. So when we are using linear parameters, we should be in a position to make measurements in the laboratory that are linear. If you are talking in terms of elastic like material, linearity is reasonably defined in a simple manner. The moment you start talking about the linearity of response of a material whose response is also time dependent, then things can become extremely complicated. That is the summary of the lecture 1. So what did we do in lecture 2? This lecture was given by Professor Padmareka from SRM Institute of Science and Technology. So she discussed in detail about the small amplitude oscillatory shear for bitumen. What she did was she first defined precisely what is oscillatory shearing. Then she introduced material functions, the modulus as well as the phase angle functions. Then she also told little bit about the energy dissipation. Okay. And she introduced something about the constitutive models, the experimental investigations and finally there was a summary. Now first and foremost thing we need to understand all the specification parameters that are given right now for binder for unmodified bitumen test the material only in oscillatory shearing or small amplitude oscillatory shearing. In a nutshell a small amplitude oscillatory shearing means if you take a material oscillated in a dynamic shear rheometer and subjected it to a sine waveform, the stress or the torque that is required to induce a sinusoidal waveform will also be a sinusoid of the same nature. So that means there are not going to be higher order harmonics. Now depending on whether you are controlling the stress or controlling the strain, you can have G prime. G double prime or J prime J double prime. 
okay and all these are possible within the Boltzmann superposition principle so that means the linearity of the response has to be always met right now what really are the what is the summary of lecture 2 the summary of lecture 2 is about storage modulus loss modulus and phase angle and these are basically functions of frequency so that means as the frequency keeps increasing the storage modulus keeps increasing okay and similarly the same case for the loss modulus also now the phase angle typically if the response of the material is purely linear viscoelastic solid you can actually expect that the phase angle will start decreasing but it is not necessary okay for the case where the material is showing a viscoelastic mixture of viscoelastic solid and fluid like behavior okay the next thing is how do we really compute the energy storage as well as the energy dissipation now if you do it in the large amplitude oscillatory shear you get the complete waveform and you can compute it but when you are doing it in a small amplitude oscillatory shear uh, what we need to do is how do we really find out since the applied load and the resulting strain are always sinusoid all we can do is to integrate and compute the energy storage and energy dissipation and this is going to be very useful to us when we write specifications for perform using performance grade and the most important standard that you should use is ASTM D7175 right ok now comes the third lecture where Dr. Padma Rekha talked about time temperature superposition principle and what is really called as master cut. Now what exactly is this time temperature superposition principle? Now since you have a material whose responses are time or frequency dependent, what one can do is when you are making measurements at different temperatures, you can always start making relation between the temperature at which you tested and the frequency at which it, you, you tested it. So this gives us phenomenal advantage in trying to compute what are all the various material functions at different temperatures and at different frequencies in which we do not have any measurements. This also comes in extremely handy when we are doing the pavement design. So to give an example, if you have recorded measurements at 15 degrees, 25 degrees, 35 degrees centigrade and if you have made measurements at let us say four different frequencies in each of these temperatures let us say 1, 2, 5, 10 hertz frequency and if you really want to find out the material functions at let us say 27 degree centigrade for 3.2 hertz frequency by using time temperature superposition principle one can find out an appropriate material function at any intermediate temperature or intermediate frequencies. Now for this there are there we have to construct a master curve. So when you construct a master curve you also need to write something about the shift factor. There are many ways many shift factors functions that are available. The most common one are the William Landel Ferry shift factor as well as the Arrhenius type shift factors. Okay, So once you have the shift factors by shifting the curve from the reference isotherm any other given isotherm we will be in a position to find, construct what is really called as the master curve and in fact the summary of the lecture 3 is given in one single sentence what it means is effect of increasing decreasing the loading time on the mechanical properties of a material is equivalent to that of raising slash lowering the temperature so if you understand this first sentence you have more or less understood what is called as time temperature superposition principle. Now the most important thing is this time temperature superposition principle is valid only if the response of the material is thermorheologically simple. If the response of the material is thermorheologically complicated, complex, you really cannot construct a master curve. What it means is at 65 degree centigrade if your response of the material is predominantly viscoelastic fluid showing a completely different relaxation spectrum 
and at 15 degree centigrade if your response of the material is predominantly viscoelastic solid and shows a completely different relaxation spectrum there is no way you can construct a master curve from 15 to 65 degree centigrade using one single shift factor approach okay now why is this useful to us this will be useful to us because when we are writing specifications for bitumen using performance grade whatever is the rutting specifications that we write for that particular binder we should also be in a position to estimate quantify compute its response at intermediate temperature so that means we have to make the connection across four decades of the temperature so that is where this is really needed now having set the theory for continuing with this course then we stepped inside to find out how asphalt is produced what are its historic usages and what we did here was we talked about the refinery processing of asphalt before that i also mentioned the abundance of bitumen in nature and the historic information very very exciting and interesting information about bitumen was discussed now what it basically tells you is at least this is something as a take home message every one of you should uh, have it in your mind is a vg30 bitumen produced by mathura refinery is not the same as the vg30 bitumen produced by visakhapatnam refinery they are different the refinery processing is different the crude oil that is used for producing this bitumen can be from different sources the proportions of different mixtures that are also that are used can also be completely different so unless a highway engineer understands the complexity of the refinery processing we will not be in a position to write clear specification so that the refiner can produce the bitumen that we are looking for okay right then comes the chemical composition of bitumen this lecture was given by dr nivita from department of civil engineering psg college of technology so what basically she did was she was looking at the scales of characterization you can have elemental analysis okay you can have molecular structure analysis you can have fractionation analysis you can also do something based on functional group analysis you can look at molecular arrangement you can also look at the morphology then she showed some interesting microstructural models and she was also trying to convey to you the relation if that exists between chemical composition as well as the physical properties now we need to understand few things in my opinion this particular lecture given by dr nivita is something in which you may have to spend lot of time to try and understand it because she has given abundant of information about the uh, chemistry of bitumen the chemistry of bitumen is exceedingly complex in, in in fact if you recollect her lecture she would have mentioned something about the isomers so it is not one constituent or one even cannot write any chemical formula for this material you can do analysis based on carbon hydrogen sulfur nickel vanadium and all those things you can look at it from the chunks of molecular structures but the most important type of studies that are normally carried out for this material in essence unfortunately is the solubility based classification system or what she has written as fractionation scheme so that means you take this material and run it through a specific solvent and depending on the various cuts that you get you talk about different constituents so she would have introduced about asphaltenes and maltenes and the maltenes she would have talked about naphthene aromatics polar aromatics as well as saturates right so these naphthene aromatics or polar aromatics are themselves a mixture of thousands and thousands of different types of molecules so what it means is we need to understand that there are different techniques that are available for different requirement in fact a highway engineer or a person who is working on bitumen should ask the simple question 
what is the chemical composition that i really want technique that i really want to use so if i am talking in terms of aging i can use ir ir will give me sufficient information about the aging that is uh, that is really happening if you are talking about how the modifiers have developed an internal structure i could do a morphology if i am interested in the transitions solid to solid transition solid to fluid transition i can do a combination of a ds or dsc study now one important thing that all of us have to understand is the performance cannot really be related to the composition of the material chemical composition of the material so this is something that needs to understand one needs to understand very clearly the lecture 6 was on aging of bitumen and on bituminous mixtures this lecture was given by dr nivita department of civil engineering phg college of technology in fact what she did here was she clearly defined it in terms of the chemical aging and what are all the changes in the chemical composition that happens during aging what is the laboratory simulation of aging what really are the codal provisions related to aging and then she summarized it to come from a different perspective when you take bitumen heat it mix it with aggregate particles lay it in the field there is some amount of aging that happens in the material what we really call as the short term aging as the material is exposed to the weather during its service there is another kind of aging that happens which is really called as the long term aging so there has to be some simulation that needs to be done in the laboratory to find out the state of the material at different stages in its service period only then we can make some statement about the expected performance of this material now the aging that you are interested is more or less in our uh, my opinion is the aging that happens due to oxidation okay you can have reversible aging you can have irreversible aging in the reversible aging there are what are really called as reversible aging that happens during the room temperature what is really called as steric hardening reversible aging that happens at low temperature what is really called as the low temperature physical hardening okay and from the perspective of measurement it is necessary that the engineer ensures that the material that he is testing testing has reached a steady state because if you don't condition the material property your data is going to be spoiled due to the steric hardening or the low temperature physical hardening right so the effect of aging can in essence lead to increase in the stiffness or viscosity of the material and laboratory simulations exercise for Mm, rtfo as well as pav and o1 mixtures were detailed here then comes the lecture on viscosity gradient of bitumen okay so this lecture more or less introduces put together all the details that we have talked till now okay one is about the uh, physical properties rheological properties as well as the chemical composition and the aging how do we really put it together in practice the very first step that people did was to do what is called as a viscosity grading what do you really do in viscosity grading you make measurements at viscosity of the material at 60 degree centigrade you make measurements for the viscosity of the material at 135 degree centigrade and then you also have a penetration test carried out at 25 degree centigrade so basically you are touching at four different temperatures this penetration at 25 degree centigrade softening point which depending on the grade of the bitumen that you get may be 48 to 52 degree centigrade viscosity at 60 degree centigrade and viscosity at 135 now if you come from the other side that viscosity at 135 degree centigrade is kinematic viscosity this is something to do with the viscosity of the binder during the compaction process viscosity at 60 typically the 60 degree centigrade is considered sacred by the highway engineers it tells you wh- what should be the viscosity of the material depending on the geographical location in which you are going to use so that one can in a sense prevent rutting that happens softening point clearly tells you the solid uh, transition the solid fluid transition 
but it is more like a consistency test in addition to penetration. There have been many attempts that have been made to relate penetration as well as softening point to the performance, but uh, nothing much, not much has actually achieved. So what is the summary of the lecture 7 and in fact in that uh, particular lecture, I gave a complete detail about how IIT Madras wrote VG10, VG20, VG30, VG40 grade of bitumen and clearly you can see the uh, manner in which this specification was formulated. Uh, we also discussed in details about some of the statistical issues that one needs to consider when uh, you are looking at the specification because there seems to be a general opinion that the VG30 and VG40 grades are overlapping. I discussed that also in detail. I request you to kindly go take a look at it and in addition we also discussed about how this specification should be put in practice. Right. Then what we did was we stepped on to performance grading of bitumen. Now what really is the issue related to viscosity grading of bitumen? In viscosity grading of bitumen, you make measurements at a fixed temperature, 60 degree centigrade. Now what if the geographical location in which you are going to use is not having a critical temperature of 60 degree centigrade, what you might really want to ask the question is, no, 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 I am not really interested in the performance of the material at a fixed temperature, but I want zero rutting at the critical temperature in my geographical location. So what it means is you should first identify the parameter that you could prescribe for rut resistance or fatigue and then check whether those values will be available at your critical location. So this is really called as the performance grading. So I looked into it from binder testing protocol, binder specification protocol and how what we will be doing in, in fact if we write PG for India. So what is the main emphasis here is you have to emphasize on temperature during service and in fact please go back and take a look at ASTM B6373 as well as IA73. The specifications are written in a completely different way. In one case the temperature is listed on the left hand side and the spec values are written on the right hand side. In the performance grading, the spec values are written on the left hand side and the temperature is written on the right hand side. So we talked about rutting parameters at high temperature, fatigue parameters at intermediate temperature in addition to AG. Then this lecture continued in uh, uh, 9 and because I wanted to show you how from the fundamentals we got this PG criteria because you use G star sin delta, G star by sin delta. So you really need to understand where this uh, is coming from. So what it means is energy dissipation is the key criteria. So in fact we want to find out what is the energy that is dissipated by the viscous component per cycle. So if in fact, what? how do you really define energy dissipation? If you take a many material and if you do a lot of work on the material, how much of the energy and when you unload it, how much of the energy that is you are able to get it back and how much is completely dissipated? That is what it really means. If your material is going to dissipate more energy, what it means is you are going to expect substantial amount of rutting at high temperature. And the same goes for intermediate temperature also because a yeah, fatigue or the coalescence of the micro crack to form a macro crack involves energy dissipation. So if the energy dissipation is going to be substantial, you need to understand that there is a imminent failure due to fatigue damage is going to be there. Now if you really look at the uh, uh, specifications very carefully, there is all possibility for you to get con con uh, confused. Okay, I have mentioned it that G star should come with two vertical lines. What the way in which it is written in ASTM is incorrect. And in fact, the FHW report also very clearly says that this symbol was dropped. So it is G star by sine delta. So they wanted to use this G star by sine delta because it gives a sense of a modulus term to the highway engineers. 
So this particular value is kept as a minimum. Ideally, it is sine delta by G star. So it is a maximum. So that means it limits the amount of dissipation that can happen at high temperature so that one can finish, minimize the rutting. In the similar way, G star times the sine delta tells you something about the fatigue, right? Then we continued our lecture about the fatigue performance grading of bitumen in which we looked at three different test methods for low temperature PG. Now what is interesting here as far as the low temperature PG is concerned, we only carried out test and in fact there are two test methods that are available. One is the direct tension test, another is the bending beam rheometer. Okay. One is a fracture test but another is a load control test. Okay, so, there is yet another procedure that is available D6816 that tells you how to find out the low temperature performance grade of asphalt binders. So, when we are talking about uh, the, this particular lecture, we need to talk in terms of the brittle, ductile and the brittle to ductile transition and how do we really use these two standards 6648 as well as 6723 to calculate the true low temperature properties of the material. So, and again one is a load displacement control test, another is a load control test, one fractures the material, one is just applying the load and allowing the material to deform. So, putting together all these things, we actually find out what is the low temperature Tg of the material. This was explained in this lecture. In the lecture 11, mixing and compaction temperature for binder, we wanted to ask only one simple question. What is the temperature to use for mixing and compaction? And here we wanted to find out how is the compaction carried out and when the compaction is being carried out, what is the status of the material binder? So there is a Newtonian, non-Newtonian transition is there and as far as unmodified bitumen is concerned, there is basically no issue. But for modified bitumen, what really happens, the non-Newtonian regime extends even at uh, high temperatures. So, fixing a precise temperature for starting the compaction becomes extremely difficult. So, most of the time, the modified binder industry will just advise you to increase the temperature by 15 degrees centigrade. So, what really was the issues that were discussed here? We talked about the non-Newtonian behavior. We talked about the workability and compactability and then we discussed three different test methods, four different test methods for finding out the mixing and compaction temperatures. Two test methods used rotational viscometers and the two test methods used the dynamic shear uh, rheometer. Okay? And one question that we need to really answer and in fact it will be very very interesting for some of the students who are taking this course to try and understand and maybe find an answer is whether the mixing and compaction will influence the mechanical properties. Then we switch to gears now that we have understood how to write specifications for bitumen, how to even uh, heat the bitumen, the temperature to which it has to be heated, we went on to finding out the various modulus parameter for bituminous mixtures. The series of lectures here were given by Dr. Neetu Roy from Marbacelius College of Engineering and Technology, right. So in the dynamic modulus lecture, what she really did was she gave clearly the development of dynamic modulus, what are the test methods, how the sample has to be prepared, what is the testing procedure, how to do the data acquisition and finally, what is the post processing of the data. One needs to very clearly understand that this dynamic modulus test is more or less the de facto standard in Northern America and people are now increasingly using it even in Europe. There are advantages of doing this test because we can go from a low temperature all the way up to 60 degrees centigrade. One can do the test for a range of frequencies from 25 hertz to 0.01 hertz frequencies. So if you recollect the discussion at, uh, related to master curve given by Dr. Padmareka, you will understand that you could use this data and fit a master curve. Once you fit a master curve, the depending on the location in which you are planning to construct your payment, 
depending on the temperature and the frequency you can actually have the modulus straight away extracted from the master curve. There are few basic assumptions that are made in this dynamic modulus test. One is the linearity. It is assumed that the response of the material can be taken as linear if the strain levels are between 75 to 125 micro strain. Number one. Number two, in the post processing method, you are not fitting any linear viscoelastic model, rather a regression approach is used and based on the components of the, uh, based on the coefficients of the regression equation, one computes the dynamic modulus and phase angle, okay. So this is the summary related to this particular lecture. Now the next lecture is given by Dr. Neetu Rai, again on resilient modulus of bituminous mixtures. This is a very, what you can say, an exciting topic for Indian highway engineers because for our IRC 37 uh, payment design guideline, we prescribe resilient modulus of bituminous mixtures and there is not much awareness in the country, be it with the students or with highway engineers on how to really go about doing it. And so most of the time what we do is we try and take the values that are provided in the design guideline and the design guidelines very clearly tells you that the highway engineer should actually test, make the measurement, right. So Dr. Neetu Rai gave a history of the development of resilient modulus, material characterization for design under ASHTO and IRC, she gave the complete difference and the test protocol as per ASTM and post processing of the data and issues associated with it. So the summary is. There was originally a standard ASTM D4123 in which you made measurement only in the horizontal direction and then you used it to compute the resilient modulus. No measurement was made in the vertical direction also. So most of the time the Poisson's ratio was just assumed. In ASTM D7369 you not only make measurement in the horizontal as well as the vertical direction, you also do it on either side. In addition, you also rotate it by 90 degrees. One needs to very clearly understand the assumptions behind resilient modulus. The moment you talk about resilient, what you really mean is after applying many, many, many cycles of loading, if you take the total strain, which consists of irrecoverable strain as well as the recoverable strain, the recoverable strain is called as the resilient elastic strain they reach a steady state. So what you really want to do is to compute a modulus based on the resilient elastic strain. Okay. Now there is a problem here because this particular test is conducted in the split tensile mode. Okay. What is really called as the Brazilian test method. Now there are limitations related to doing this test for a wide range of temperature and frequency. In our laboratory we have not been able to do it more than 35 degrees centigrade. Even at 35 degrees centigrade, the gauges will pop out. Then there are issues related to the gauge length. There are issues related to the number of cycles to be used for reaching the steady state. Okay, see these are all some of the details that was given by Dr. Neetura. And in fact, some of you have even asked questions when these lectures were given. Can we do it for cold mix? Can we do it for... Mm -hmm, different types of mixes. Now the answer to this question is yes and no. What do, what do I mean by yes? If, it, if you understand how is the this test method is conducted, the assumptions behind the theory and if the material that you are planning to use is uh, more or less following these assumptions that are made, you can do it. But when I say no, what it means is the standards, the procedure that is um, prescribed here is more tuned towards bituminous mixtures. Is it for cold mixtures? If you are doing research and development, yes, you can do whatever you want. But if you are a practicing engineer and if you want to really find out whether one can use it for cold mix, I will advise caution here because the cold mix can also behave like a granular material. So, this particular test method may not necessarily be suitable to you, right. Then Dr. Neetu Rai started talking about the distress. So she was here talking about the rutting in bituminous pavement. So she talked about the various approaches to investigate rutting, okay. So you can have 
a test track similar to what is you see in NCAT. You can have a controlled test road, what is really called as an accelerated loading facility in which the temperature, everything is uh, uh, correctly, precisely controlled. Or you can have a laboratory test method in which you could do the, uh, at the laboratory you can do it. Now we need to understand clearly things. Please focus your attention on the first and the third one. Rutting in bituminous pavement is different, rutting in bituminous mixtures is different. When you are talking about rutting in bituminous mixtures, you are talking about making measurements at the laboratory on one sample. Then the dry rut wheel, track, wheel tracking test was discussed and the data acquisition as well as the post processing method was also discussed here. So first and foremost the thing is we need to understand the field testing to control the section to section to laboratory testing and she discussed about the dry wheel testing. Now in my opinion or in the opinion of most of the highway engineers this dry rut wheel testing or the wet dry wheel testing can be considered as a very nice clear pass fail test okay nothing more nothing less that means if you have two products and you want to evaluate which product will show better performance compared to the other product okay you can run the test on this and then you can rank it so let us not extrapolate it and in the final lecture given by dr neetu rai she talked about how to do the flow number as well as the flow time test to compute what is really called as rutting for bituminous mixtures. So she talked about the development of AMPT and in fact AMPTs were the one that basically helped us to compute to measure the dynamic modulus, flow time and flow number. So she discussed the flow time test, flow number test and the associated post processing conditions. So what is the most important way in which you will say a flow number test is where you load, load it and unload it. Whereas in the flow time test you just only apply a load. The basic model that is used here is a three stage creep curve and the corresponding secondary to tertiary is taken as the flow number and it could be used as a possible mixed design tool and in fact I will strongly suggest the Indian highway engineers that they start measuring the flow number and integrate it as part of their Marshall method of mixed design that they are familiar with using. Right? The final very final lecture on this particular topic about rutting of distress was given by fatigue uh, Dr. Padma Rekha. She talked about the fatigue here. Again she talked very clearly about the fatigue in bituminous layer to the laboratory characterization of the bituminous mixtures in fatigue and how to use it in a performance based equipment. So this is more or less the clear way in which I will put together the summary of the lecture. So we need to one need to very clearly understand if you look at the top left picture the uh, strain versus the number of cycle fatigue is always at this end which means the load application that you give will result in strains that are substantially less and the number of cycles will be more and there is a linear viscoelastic regime that you will see at the starting point because there is going to be in essence energy dissipation due to the viscoelastic thing and if you go slightly up you are getting into the non-linear uh, deformation and the temperature influence is also indicated. Now if you look at the top right picture you can do this test in terms of the stress control or you can do it in the strain control. When you do it in the stress control what will really happen? The strain keeps on increasing because you are applying continuous loading cycles and the strain increases. On the other hand if you do the on the strain control you will actually see that the stresses starts decreasing because the material is getting completely damaged. Now there are some issues related to doing the test with beam bending way and it is given in the bottom left there are three uh, different configurations that are shown here. So what can happen is because of this repeated loading the neutral positions can also vary in a way. And finally uh, if you look at the bottom right you will see that I have written different post processing method exists in a sense how do we really compute the um, fatigue life. We can do it in many many different ways. And finally this equation that is shown here will help us 
to write distress equation and this could be one can find it out some portion of it by analyzing the fatigue test okay and in the 17th lecture uh, dr nivita gave you an introduction on curve fitting using matlab and she also told you how to do the analysis msr analysis using matlab right so thank you very much for paying attention uh, we acknowledge government of india for making this possible and iit madras as well as the amazing team of nptel at iit madras please feel free to get in touch with any one of us if you when have any questions related to this course